REM Occupational Health and Wellness is an on-site occupational health and wellness company where all services are provided on-site at your place of employment, including imaging. Our mission is to minimize workplace injuries by focusing on employee engagement to prioritize their own health and safety. By engaging employees in this process, we can mitigate injuries in a multi-generational workplace, providing the highest return on investment for each employer. By providing on-site occupational health services, injuries can be evaluated quickly and efficiently, decreasing the need for outside hospital system usage. Our team Our conducts team a conducts thorough investigation, investigation into causation, causation and, will and will collaborate with you throughout the entire process. process. Our, team Our team works, works very closely, closely with Crawford, Crawford Evaluation Group for their expertise as well. Crawford Evaluation Group is a leading provider of elite medical experts for the purpose of second opinions. We are highly focused, offering independent medical evaluations and medical record reviews to the Workers' Compensation Claims Community. We are consultants for our clients to understand the nuances of each claim and to recommend uniquely qualified physicians on a case-by-case -case basis. We also take a lot of pride in providing opportunities for education through our legal and medical expert partnerships. This series with REM Occupational Health and Wellness is an example of that. Welcome to our monthly video podcast series, Current Trends in Treatment and Workers' Compensation. Welcome to our online viewers. I'm David Crawford, and I'm here to introduce our guest speakers. Today's topic in episode two is a medical and legal analysis of slap tears, addressing issues surrounding misdiagnosis and erroneous causation opinions. We've got Dr. Bruce Somerville. He's an orthopedic surgeon with a fellowship in adult reconstruction, total joint replacement. Dr. Somerville joined the CEG medical expert panel in Wisconsin and has established himself as an expert in appropriate treatment and causation. We have Alicia Kelch, a PA and the owner and founder of REM Occupational Health and Wellness. Alicia is joining us remotely. She's a provider of on-site occupational health and wellness services. Her staff thoroughly investigates workplace injuries, providing detail and authoritative analysis on causation. And we have Chelsea Springstead, a partner with the law firm of Lindner and Marzak, Ms. Springstead's current legal practice is focused on defending workers' compensation claims for the insurance industry and self-insured employers. We'll start with Dr. Somerville. Hello, welcome. Um, my slide uh, presentation is to educate all of you regarding slap tears. I, I think we all have heard the term, maybe we don't know or understand that it's an acronym for superior labrum anterior posterior tears. And um, I think by the end of this discussion, you'll realize that although slap tears may be relatively common, uh, they're in many ways and many times not symptomatic in many people. They're often a uh, incidental finding on MRI and also at the time of surgery. So um, these were first described uh, several decades ago by uh, <clears throat> Andrews. And then further, the definition was expanded upon by Steve Snyder in Los Angeles. Uh, these are two highly respected uh, longtime sports medicine physicians. And what they realized upon treating a number of young athletes is that um, the superior labrum where the bicep tendon attaches could actually detach from the top of the glenoid socket of the shoulder joint. And this detachment would lead to symptoms uh, because the bicep was no longer tensioned correctly, it was loose and it could cause snapping and pain. Um, they initially described four subtypes, one through four and three, uh, excuse me, two through four are typically those that are the result of trauma and direct injury, whereas a type one which could be in any one of our shoulders here, is typically degenerative. Uh, doesn't mean you have to have arthritis of the shoulder joint, but the glenoid, excuse me, the labral tissue is showing signs of wear and tear. Um, now, 
the um, number of slap tears I think I uh, alluded to is actually more, it's a relatively uncommon diagnosis, but it's more commonly asymptomatic than it is um, symptomatic. And so if you look at the numbers, and these are, these are uh, journal peer-reviewed articles that I've quoted here for the purpose of these slides. So uh, I just want the audience to be aware that you know, these aren't necessarily my opinions or my own experience. These numbers are from very, very active shoulder surgeons who do thousands of shoulder surgeries you know, over their career. And they have pooled numbers and they've looked. And in one case, the number of slap tears is only 6% amongst individuals undergoing shoulder arthroscopy. Um, so the, the mechanism of slap tears has also been determined primarily to be either due to trauma, such as a fall on one's outstretched arm, or um, let's imagine somebody walking downstairs, slipping, beginning to fall, grabbing a handrail and torquing their shoulder, or the other and probably more common um, demographic is an elite athlete, such as a volleyball player or a swimmer who, um, you know, their shoulder is put through years and years of repetitive stress. Um, but slap tears, this, this pure labrum and the labrum in general is pretty resilient. So slap tears are not typically caused by simply lifting a heavy item overhead or pushing a heavy item. It's either going to be the result of repetitive activity over a long period of time, usually in elite athletes, sometimes very heavy laborers, or the result of a traumatic injury of, of the type that I just described. Um, so again, the incidence of slap tears, if you look at the next slide, uh, one more, please, there. Um, so 26% of 544 shoulder arthroscopies revealed a slap tear. 74% um, were type 1. Those are the type, that, as I mentioned, that's the type that is considered degenerative and atraumatic. So if you do the math on that, three quarters of approximately 25% are basically just wear and tear. That leaves, you know, a quarter of a quarter that is actually pathologic or traumatic. So that's a relatively small number. Um, and the most common of those three types, two, three, and four that are traumatic is the type two. And I have some images, uh, arthroscopic that I'll show you in a moment. So you understand the different, uh, morphology of the two, uh, four types of slap tears. Um, so the type two tears were more common in individuals, individuals 40 years or younger. And that's another point to emphasize that traumatic symptomatic slap tears are a young person's disease. I rarely, if ever, fix a slap tear or consider it pathologic because there's other ways to treat it. You, you can perform a bicep tenodesis, but I rarely treat that in an individual over the age of 50, uh, particularly if there's other pathologies, such as a rotator cuff tear or some other reason why they might have pain. Because it's, it's often, again, a very incidental finding um, either on MRI or at the time of arthroscopy. So again, the type two slap tear is most common. Um, the t that's simply a detachment of the labrum where the bicep attaches to it. So the, lay the slap, excuse me, the labrum detaches from the glenoid. A type three is a bucket handle tear of a portion of the labrum. And a type four is a tear of a bucket handle tear with a tear up into the bicep. And we'll, I, again, I have images of that. So you'll have a better understanding. Um, so um, again, the, the different types of slap tears I've just discussed. And then you can, if you go to the next slide, you can see that um, these have been subclassified. Um, you can go to the next slide. And uh, the relevant point is not so much this classification, but really delineating the what type ones from all of the other slap tears, because the type ones are typically, again, degenerative 
not related to trauma, the type two, and you know, now we have seven different slap tears, um, two through seven, those are typically the result of trauma. So now if we move on, you see these images. Okay, so the left image of the series is a schematic. And of course the other image is what we look at arthroscopically with the camera. So in the upper left pattern A, that would be considered a degenerative um, type one slap tear. And that is something that, you know, one, you wouldn't repair that. It's just an incidental finding. You might debreed it, but honestly, it's very unlikely that that finding is going to be symptomatic for anyone. The type two in the B series, um, you see is a detachment of the labrum from the glenoid where it should be firmly attached. Uh, the arthroscopic photo on that, this one is not as good as the others, but what we can do with surgery as a surgeon, we can take that little metal probe you see in that image, and we can actually get the end of that probe between the glenoid socket and the labrum. And that is the key finding on uh, arthroscopic exam. Additionally, if one has an MR arthrogram prior to surgery, uh, we will see dye leaking through that crevice or that detachment site. Whereas in the type one, you will not see dye leaking through the labral tissue and the glenoid interval. Um, the C and D in the lower left and right are much less common. Um, you can see the bucket handle tear. That's very similar to what we call a bucket handle tear in a knee for a meniscal tear. And then the type D is um, with extension of the bucket handle tear into the biceps tissue. So the treatment of these we can get into later, but one debris or A type one debris or do nothing, B repair depending on the patient's age, or do a biceps tenotomy or tenodesis as we want to get that tension off that labrum so that bicep isn't pinching and getting caught in the joint. C would actually be a debridement, not a repair. Uh, and four would probably be a debridement of the labrum and then a tenodesis or a tenotomy of the bicep tendon, both. Um, if you, if we move on to the examination of the shoulder, um, this is a busy slide, but the point of it is, is that many, uh, surgeons in the academic world have come up with their own examination tools to try to determine, uh, what findings constitute a slap tear when we examine a patient? We all know, I think, rotator cuff tears typically hurt along the lateral deltoid, hurt with overhead motion, and are described as causing achy pain, pain at night, difficulty with getting comfortable. Slap tears are more sort of uh, episodic, and meaning that Patients with symptomatic slap tears kind of have figured out what they can and cannot do with their arm to avoid being symptomatic. So typically it's putting their arm away from their body, lifting something heavy would be activities to avoid. And on examination, uh, one of the more common tests that we perform is an O'Brien test where we bring the arm across the body and put stress on it and see if that's that pain, if it's uh, elicited with the forearm pronated with it supinated, does the pain go away? And the reason is that takes the bicep out of the equation. I mean, it's still in the shoulder, but it, it takes it away from being on stretch when the, when the form is supinated and el eliminates pain. But all of these examination provocative tests have very widespread sensitivity and specificities. So sensitivity means what is the ability of that exam uh, maneuver to be accurate, so to speak, uh, and elicit uh, symptoms if somebody has a slap tear. Specificity means what do we? What does the test rule out? Uh, or if it's negative, does it really mean the patient doesn't have a slap tear? Um, the same is often said of MRIs, and we can get into the imaging of this in a moment. But the point is, the examination is important. But sometimes the examination is more important after the claimant or the patients had the MRI to, to corroborate what you're seeing on MRI with their symptoms, both subjectively and objectively on exam. Dr. Somerville, 
Yes. Why is it that the type ones are largely asymptomatic? Um, I would say that it has no effect on the stability of the shoulder. So what does the labrum do, right? Okay. It, it creates a greater concavity to the overall glenohumeral joint. Because it's still attached, there's no effect on stability of the shoulder and it has no effect on the attachment of the bicep because it's not unstable. Additionally, the type ones are more common in older people because it's a wear and tear degenerative condition. Older individuals are less active. They're not, you know, out throwing a, a ball or playing tennis. Not, I'm not saying exclusively, but as a demographic as a whole, they're not as active where they may be stressing their shoulder joint. But I think the main issue is the shoulder's not unstable because the labrum's intact and the bicep is not unstable because its insertion site has not been compromised. So again, back, back to causation, uh, I mentioned this before um, that again, the vast majority of the tra traumatic two through four, if we use that classification, are the type two tears. And again, the etiologies, if you look in this slide, direct compression injury, um, repetitive overhead injury, traction injury. Um, and so in the workman's uh, compensation environment, in my opinion, and based on the literature, unless one has one of those mechanisms of injury or perhaps even a dislocated shoulder, it's unlikely that they are going to develop a type two, three or four slap tear. Um, now, imaging of slap tears. It is very, very important that, well, as a rule, anyone under 40 with a shoulder injury, not, not somebody who just has three months of shoulder pain, but one of those documented injury mechanisms that I described, they need an MR arthrogram. There is, it's a waste of time to get a non-contrast MRI because the sensitivity may be high, there may be an abnormality, but you cannot distinguish accurately between a type one or a type two through four slap tear. You need that dye to outline the labrum and determine whether it's uh, leaking through, if you will, the uh, junction between the glenoid and the labrum. And so, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you literature so you not that you don't think that I don't know this, but just so you hear it directly from the source, you know, non-contrast MRI had a sensitivity of 38% and specificity of 94%. So that means it's got a low ability to pick up the pathologic traumatic slap tears. But if the MRI is negative without contrast, no abnormality of the labrum or the slap, then it's probably truly negative. So if you want to pick up the pathologic findings, you need the dye. Um, So essentially anyone under 40 and some over 40, I routinely order an MR arthrogram. Obviously you don't need that uh, if you're looking to diagnose a rotator cuff tear. Um, some people routinely get MRIs with, with dye, which is fine, but I think it's wrong to routinely get MRIs uh, without any contrast. And it's also more important to have the arthrogram after surgery, if someone is not progressing or complaining of pain, because you will in no way be able to determine if that slap or, or a rotator cuff tear has healed without the dye. Because um, any surgical procedure leaves a footprint of pattern of, you know, uh, imaging or on the MRI that may look like a new tear or may be just a sequela of the previous surgery and the quote unquote inflammation and changes that were performed as a result of the surgery. So um, these are MRI images. I won't go through all of these, um, but you can see the little arrow. So typically if you're gonna evaluate for a slap tear, you're gonna look on the coronal or the AP images and you'll see dye leaking through the, uh, you know, it depends if it's a T1 or T2 image or that you're looking at, but you'll see the dye leaking through the junction between the uh, labrum and the glenoid. I think the next slide shows that pretty well. So if you see in the lower right or the right side slide, you see how the dark arrow 
and then you have the white arrow and there's dye that's actually there's a passageway if you will between that uh, darker tissue which is the glenoid uh, excuse me the labrum and then the glenoid which is um the whiter uh tissue and the bone there and the same um shade of white as the humeral head so th that's uh this is a very characteristic um finding for somebody with a type 2 slap tear and then the radiologists are good at sorting out the type threes and fours but those are pretty rare anyway so um, most of the time this would be something that um, the surgeon and the radiologist would look for if there's a question uh, of a slap tear dr summer um, though yes Yes. So then for the adjusters, the nurse case managers and the general practitioners like myself on this, and we have a patient with an unclear mechanism of injury to their shoulder, would you recommend we go straight to an MRI with contrast then so that we can fully distinguish what it is with the first imaging study? Under 40, yes. Okay. What do you recommend for over 40? If you don't know the mechanism of injury, well, let's say under 50 for sure. 40 okay. to 50 the gray zone under 40 absolutely if you don't know the mechanism of injury or there was no injury i think over sure. 50 is safe to get a non-contrast mri okay i think so, more times go ahead. go ahead i was about to say i think more times than not we often hear that the employee or the patient was working and they developed pain so that's what i meant by maybe unclear so um that's really good guidance though what you just gave right so if, if it's just sort of the onset of pain without a specific traumatic injury um, and they were just in their normal course of job activities nothing unexpected um, i would just use the age-based um, i mean the other thing is too you want to look for pre-existing as well so maybe somebody's working with a slap tear and and you know they they believe it or not people can get along sometimes fairly well with some of these pathologies, not just in the shoulder, but other body musculoskeletal areas and be unaware or tolerant of symptoms. So sometimes you want the study just to say, which is actually what my next slide brings us to. So it's a good segue. Um, these paralabral cysts are developed similar to a Baker cyst behind the knee uh, as a result of a longstanding slap tear. So the hydrostatic pressure of the synovial fluid uh, causes the fluid to leak from the joint and develop these cysts. Again, similar to a Baker's cyst, it becomes a one-way valve and the fluid becomes hyper-concentrated into these synovial cysts. So I don't know the exact cutoff. I can't tell you at six weeks, a cyst represents a chronic tear or, you know, have, have, do these take three months to develop? But I can tell you when I see an individual who has an MRI performed soon after an alleged traumatic injury, and they already have paralabral cysts, that's, that tells me that that, um, slap tear has been present for some time and probably deep predates any work injury. Very similarly to what we look for with a rotator cuff tear and a high riding humeral head and a decreased acromiohumeral interval. I can't tell you what the cutoff is. There's a range, but somebody who has an MRI uh, or X-ray soon after a traumatic injury and already has a high riding humeral head, uh, especially if they had a dislocation, makes it pretty likely that's pre-existing. Um, so the paralabral cysts are not that commonly found, but for that reason, they can be helpful as sort of an interpretation of um, the age uh association of the injury and the pathology. Do you see um, often, I guess, especially when you see like a paralabral cyst and it's, you know, you're leaning towards this being pre-existing, would um, any type of injury aggravate or accelerate that or a slap tear if there's any symptomatic slap tear that's been present? Uh, that's a good question. And uh, you mean extend the slap tear? Yes. Yeah. If it's, if it's been asymptomatic and in, in workers' comp, it's kind of part of the causation. Sure. You know, conundrum. Right. Aggravation so and progression. Correct. Right. Um, I would say that's pretty unlikely. Okay. And uh, I suppose if somebody dislocated their shoulder, if it was that significant, but just from, 
you know, lifting something heavy or losing control of something and having shoulder pain, I, th I think it's more likely than not that you're not going to extend uh, a slap tear. So, so it's probably fair to say that if somebody had a traumatic injury, um, goes in right away and gets the MR scrim and they see the paralabal cysts, likely that's not the cause of whatever their pain is at the time. It's just a kind of incidental finding as far as a slap tear. Well, correct. The cysts don't cause the pain. They just help us interpret. So if you were to see paralabral cysts and you had a non-contrast MRI, you could say with almost 100% certainty that's a slap tear because there's really no other reason. It's like, it's like an inferior osteophyte on a humeral head. That only develops because of glenohumeral osteoarthritis. So, yeah, if you had an MRI without contrast, you could say that. I, um, I, I had a just interestingly, as an aside, I had a um, a report that I reviewed, and um, it was a failed. Uh, I think it was a failed slap repair, and the treating physician was a sports medicine fellowship trained uh, doctor. And he wanted a follow-up MRI, but he didn't want to order dye. And in my report, I said, well, we can't make a conclusion as to whether it's healed or not. And uh, he repeated the MRI, but refused to use the dye, <laughs> which kind of surprised me because he's sports medicine trained. But And there's a lot of literature on that. I didn't include it here, but there's actually a couple, uh, at least one excellent radiology article, which defines how these structures are to look after surgery at one length of time on an MRI with an out, without dye. And we're not, to, I don't mean just labral tears. I mean, sla, uh, labral slap tears, rotator cuff tears. So it's an excellent article to guide us surgeons if we do follow up MRIs on our patients who aren't doing well or having pain or decreased range of motion to help us determine, okay, what's look, what should look, what looks normal at what period in time? So if anyone's interested in that article, I can provide it. Um, anyway, um, so we'll look at some photos now of intraarticular of, uh, so this is a normal labrum. You see the bicep, you see the labrum, you see the junction between the cartilage and the, uh, so the uh, hyaline cartilage, which is the harder cartilage on the face of the glenoid and the fibro cartilage, which makes up the labrum. Now, there's no probe, the little metal stick with a little curved end here. But if you were to try to get uh, that probe tip between the junction of the labrum and glenoid, you would not be able to do it because there's no tear there. And if you look, um, you see, again, normal anatomy. You have the bicep. So on the left is the arthroscopic photo. On the right is the schematic, and you see how the uh, bicep attaches to the superior labrum. Uh, there are variations in exactly where, but if you think of the glenoid as a clock face, so in a right shoulder, well, both shoulders, 12 o'clock approximately is where the bicep is going to attach. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's anything either side of that, uh, say, you know, from 11 to one o'clock could be the attachment site. And also any tear within that region would be considered a slap tear from in, in a right shoulder from 11 to one or in a left shoulder from uh, one to 11 going the other way. Um, so there are variations of this anatomy and it, these can look like labral and slap tears. And so you need an astute radiologist and some experience visualizing these images on MRI. They're not that common. The um, so-called Buford complex, which is in the next slide, is probably present in, present in 5% of people or less, but it certainly can look like a slap tear. And that's something you would never wanna repair because it'll just tighten up one shoulder. That's their, that, is this individual's normal anatomy. And now we'll go to the specific types of slap tears. Here you see the probe elevating um, the uh, labrum off the glenoid. You see the red, that's evidence, another indirect 
uh, measure of trauma that has been sustained, that's bleeding. That's a sign also that there's been some trauma to the shoulder. And then if we move on to the next slide, you'll see uh, the repair. And it's interesting, this has evolved now that we're no longer tying knots. We're using knotless anchors to repair these. Um, and the overall size of the anchor has become much smaller. I'm using 1.8 millimeter anchors in diameter, whereas uh, early on we we're using anchors that were over three millimeters. And the advantage of that is we can place many more anchors because you only have so much real estate. So you can place many more anchors to repair the labrum and get a more secure watertight closure. <clears throat> um, if you go to the next slide, this is another example of a slap labral, sort of a bank art repair. And um, we'll go to the, now in terms of treatment, um, you can see here patient age, symptoms, physical exam, activity level, associated pathology are all important considerations. So this is not a matter of simply getting an MRI, seeing a slap tear and saying you need surgery. I mean, I've treated slap tears non-surgical in a tennis pro, and he did great. And probably because he had so much physical reserve. I mean, the slap tear is not going to heal. The question is, can we resolve the pain? And so simply because one has a slap tear is not an immediate reason, uh, even in a laborer, to do surgery. Um, so again, the recommendation uh, right from the academics is an initial trial of non-operative management, preferred initial treatment in a non-throwing athlete, therapy focused on range of motion, strengthening of the deltoid and rotator cuff, activity modification. In the throwing athlete, therapy involves assessment of throwing mechanics and core and trunk strength. Now, that's in an athlete. In a laborer, um, same thing. We would uh, want to resolve the acute pain and inflammation and then... Um, advance activity and see how uh, someone feels that that conservative management could be, you know, six to 12 weeks before making a determination as to whether or not somebody's going to fail uh, non-surgical treatment. And then uh, I want to just briefly talk a little bit about failed slap repairs and this is some of the treatment options, actually, not only for fail, but also primary slap repairs, tenotomy versus tenodesis. Um, this is highly debated. There's no right answer. Uh, probably older individuals and individuals who are less active, uh, we would we could, could lean more towards tenotomy. Tenodesis would be more beneficial to a heavy laborer. Um, because without the bicep firmly attached, uh, even though there's the short head of the bicep, some individuals with repetitive heavy activity will complain of soreness, not so much weakness, but just fatigue and um, achiness. Um, so this is a topic that is uh, very much written about currently in the orthopedic literature. So um, if, if we... You can see here, this would be an intraarticular or, or in the groove tenodesis with an anchor. Many uh, surgeons are now moving towards a subpectoral uh, pectoral tenodesis, taking the bicep completely out of the shoulder joint. Uh, both work. There's, again, data that suggests one may be better than the other, but it's not conclusive at this time. <clears throat> so, again, um, this is a schematic or an algorithm, if you will, for a failed slap repair. And you can see how age drives much of the decision making um, and also the activity level of the individual involved. You know, do you attempt to reattach, repair? Do you do a tenotomy, tenodesis? Um, so then evaluating a slap repair if one is still symptomatic and obviously it's not uncommon in our workers comp compensation for individuals to still complain of pain um, and as i said the mr arthrogram is very valuable in assessing the degree of healing uh, of a slap repair um, this algorithm kind of walks us through how we should treat these individuals 
uh, post-surgery uh, if they're not recovering as expected. So the average recovery time for a slap repair is, you know, on the order of four to six months, depending on uh, work uh, activities uh, or work job description. Um, but um, the, um, the issue with the slap repair is not just a physical issue, it's a biological issue, meaning that some patients will feel great and they'll want to increase their activity faster than biologically should be allowed because of what we understand about the amount of healing time it takes for the labrum to heal back to the glenoid after a repair. Uh, just a few more uh, notes about failed slap repair. Just um, I think you have to become sort of a detective after uh, any failed surgery, of course, but unless the uh, MRI or examination doesn't clearly point to the cause for failure, uh, I think it's important to work through these algorithms um, because people, we don't want to have individuals undergo, you know, one, two, three, four surgeries, which of course we've all seen, particularly in the workers' comp uh, uh, arena, especially since some of those surgeries create iatrogenic problems. And now you've got a whole separate uh, ball of wax there. So um, final uh, conclusions. Um, I do a lot of diagnostic injections. Uh, I think uh, we call them diagnostic therapeutic injections. Sometimes I will simply inject lidocaine, Novocaine, into a shoulder joint and see if the patient's pain goes away. Um, and it's interesting when you do this on both workers' comp and non-workers' comp patients, the workers' comp patients often will say, eh, pain's 50% resolved. My non-workers' comp patients, it's all or none. They either have pain relief or they have persistent pain. Um, but even in the workers' comp environment, this can be a valuable tool. And we don't have, even have to use steroids. I mean, lidocaine will give you an hour. You can have the individual stay in your office for, you know, 10 minutes. It works rapidly. So if there's concern about injecting steroid into a young person's shoulder simply to make a diagnosis, because if it was a symptomatic slap tear, we don't treat that with steroid, then I would just use lidocaine. And again, that uh, can be a powerful uh, adjunct to your whole sort of diagnostic toolbox. All right, so in conclusion, you see uh, slap tears are often overdiagnosed and overtreated. Uh, they're more common in those under 40, at least the ones that are uh, symptomatic and pathologic and traumatic. Uh, over 40 and certainly 50, um, many of these slap tears, if not most, are type one or degenerative. And even the type twos, if I'm performing a rotator cuff tear on a 55 or 60 year old, this, you recall some of those slides, how floppy that uh, labrum looked. I won't touch that. I won't do a tenotomy or tenodesis. The only time I might consider that is if there was no other pathology evident, but I would have already known that because I would have had an MRI and I wouldn't be operating on them anyway, unless I thought they had a rotator cuff tear or some other pathology. Um, if you see a report, in my opinion, where the surgeon debrides the labrum, it's not a traumatic work-related slap tear. Thank you. Chelsea, from your perspective, what types of things can myself, the other clinicians, the nurse case managers, what type of things can we do on our end to help things on your end when you're preparing a case? Is it things like making sure we have a very clearly defined mechanism of injury? Is it getting together with safety, doing an ergo eval? Um, so tell me some things from your standpoint that would help um, when it gets to you. Yes, and I, and I think this ties in, you know, being a heavily medical topic, um, somewhat to what Dr. Somerville is saying, and, and some of this question, I think it's it's kind of directed at him as well, because the file comes to me, I'm usually preparing it to put in the best, you know, case scenario or, or have as much information as I can before referring it out to Dr. Somerville to review um, and give us his medical opinion, because it sounds like most of this is 
more medical than legal in nature. Um, but my, you know, my thoughts, and, and I guess Dr. Phil, you can confirm if this helps you on exam or not um, when you're doing IMEs for us. Um, yeah, the mechanism of injury and fleshing out exactly what happened, um, especially now listening to this presentation, which was very interesting and eye-opening as far as um, degeneration versus traumatic. You know, most often we're seeing the type two um, traumatic slap tears. So knowing that if someone comes in with a type two tear and is claiming repetitive work activity, that may be something to question um, more so than traumatic when they reported the injury, um, how soon after, um, and what, uh, the, the next thing would be the treatment, right? The MR um, arthrogram and knowing now that an MRI without contrast is somewhat useless, um, especially in those under, you know, the 40 or 50 range uh, is extremely helpful just from diagnostic purposes. And to hear that it's often um, misdiagnosed or diagnosed as kind of an incidental finding that may not actually have been causing, you know, the pain. Um, I feel like that may be also what leads to the uh, failed slap repairs mm -hmm. is maybe repairs being done on people who that's not what's actually causing um, yeah. their injury. Is there anything else? Um, would an ergonomic assessment help you? I mean, given that most of these are not repetitive for our type of workers, unless they're heavy workers, um, because ergonomic is usually to address, you know, the repetitive occupational injuries and, you know, the stress um, they're putting on them. If it's a type two through four, is that as helpful to you or not? I, I think probably not or less so. I think just having their really what their job description is and the number of years they've been at that occupation. Because again, the vast majority of these are due to acute trauma or repetitive, high stress. Imagine a swimmer or a volleyball player. And I don't mean just a recreational, but I'm talking mm -hmm. about a collegiate volleyball Michael player. Phelps. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, they have hip label tears, shoulder label tears. Um, and so it's just not common that somebody, even with a heavy level, you know, is determined by the Department of Labor, is going to be at that occupation long enough. It's possible for decades that they're going to develop a detached slap repair, more likely it's going to be traumatic. I mean, uh, degenerative. Yeah. So that's something for the adjusters who are watching, you know, when you, when you get these claims, I guess, things to question, um, that degenerative versus traumatic when it was reported, if it was traumatic, um, and the mechanism of injury, it, like you said, with the outstretched arm, you know, versus potential other mechanisms, um, and, and kind of, looking closer, I guess, especially into those n initial medical records um, yeah. to determine if the slap tear was actually the cause of right. the concern or is just a incidental finding that's being blamed right. for the injury. I mean, unfortunately, or however the case may be, many of these individuals are laborers and they bounce around jobs and whether they were hurt elsewhere or just at home, they bring that injury to their next employer yep. and whether they're aware of it or they just learned how to live with it. Um, unfortunately, sometimes then when they sustain a quote unquote injury or the onset of pain, you know, it's a whole mix of motivation and is there secondary gain? Is there something truly wrong? So it's a lot to sort through. And, and, and I, you know, I'm not immediately suspicious of anyone who's had a work injury, but you kind of have to put the puzzle together, I guess, is what I'm saying. Uh, that not only goes for slap tears, it goes for meniscal tears, uh, all kinds of musculoskeletal injuries. And as we know, many many of the work comp patients we see, but I think this is general for most patients, you know, if they didn't know they had a slap tear, maybe it was from a prior employer or degenerative or, you know, outside activity. Um, now they get injured at work or, or start feeling pain at work. They go in and that's one of the findings. They didn't know it before. They automatically say, well, that's that's got to be it because I was at work. Now I have the slap tear. It's got to be work caused a slap tear, which is causing, you know, it's right. And then it, it's connecting the dots, but it, it really isn't that simple. Right. I, I mean, I don't know how much time we want to spend on this, uh, <laughs> but 
me personally as a surgeon, and I'll, you know, I'll get off my soapbox, but I don't want to operate on people unless I think they have a high likelihood of getting better. Okay. I, I don't want work comp or non-work comp. Okay. And so, um, because, because then you own them, right? Like if I work, do surgery and they don't improve, or right? The diagnosis isn't correct. Well, now <laughs> they're yours forever. And, you know, I, I don't, the idea of having to, um, do more workup, figure out, I, I think you should get the diagnosis as correct as you can the first time. And sometimes it's not that easy. And as I said, I'll often get the MRI and then work backwards. Because if I, someone says they have pain from whatever injury and I get an MRI and it's like, well, it's totally clean. You're, you, okay. We got to look at your neck or once you exhaust everything, like I can't help you, you know, I don't know what's wrong, but to operate on somebody who, uh, the pieces don't fit together as best they can. I'm not saying in every case, it's hundred percent, you know, transparent. It's opaque sometimes. Uh, I, I think that's for just for me personally, I, that's not the way I would want to approach it. If we're looking at, you know, the type two, which I said in workers comp just seems to be the most common that we see, right. um, slap tear, what would you say on average would be an anticipated both through conservative treatment. And then we'll talk about also if they have to undergo surgery, like healing period and what can we expect for permanency out of it? Or, you know, could there be none? Right. So I would, uh, I'd probably treat that initially, uh, with up to six weeks of physical therapy rest, you know, cause you gotta remember this is a traumatic injury to begin with. Right. So there's going to be some, you saw the one slide, with the, the blood on the, there's bleeding, there's swelling, there's stiffness as a result, let that subside. And then uh, not everyone with a slap tear needs surgery. Not everyone has an activity or a job description whereby they're going to be stressing their shoulders so much that they, that they need surgery. Um, if they do fail to improve and everything seems aligned in terms of the MRI, their clinical symptoms, their physical exam, and you perform surgery, in general, they'll be restricted for the first six weeks after surgery to a five pound. It's not so much the range of motion like restriction as it is with a rotator cuff. It's more the weight because that puts traction on the bicep, which you've just reattached effectively through the labrum. So the biceps attached to the labrum, you've reattached the labrum. So after that, there's different protocols, but typically it's increase in five pound or reduction in five pound restriction per week until they meet whatever their job requirements are. So again, and also the biology of it is it's probably not fully healed until four months. So even though somebody may have excellent range of motion and be feeling well, sometimes we have to slow those people down. I, I mean, that's not something I see commonly in the work comp environment, <laughs> yeah. but in my own patients who may be athletes or who are motivated to get back to their sport, we have to slow them down sometimes. And then what, um, both conservatively and surgically, do you, is it a range of permanency? Can they have none versus? Oh, right. So a, a healed slap repair. I just discharged a patient today. He, he, he was not, I was it? I don't think it was work comp. 20 something. He's great. Full motion, full strength, no pain. He's back to normal. So all their medical care is paid for. You know, all of this yeah. better than I do, but time missed from work, all yeah. the hourly wage, but there's no permanency there. You you've made them normal. Now, if you do a total knee, that's a change. That's worthy of, it looks like we have a question here from David Crawford. Do you ever see surgery recommended on slap tear type one injuries, which as you stated, should not need surgery? I see non-contrast MRIs diagnosing slap tears and then undergoing surgery and no one ever saying it's a type one tear, but debriding it or maybe repairing it. But I'm not sure how you would do that if it's not detached and it, there's a lot of this dancing around sometimes in the op reports and the no one's always not it's not always stated that it's a type one tear but that's why i mentioned if uh one has an mri that shows a tear and it's simply debrided then it's a type one tear because otherwise it would have been repaired unless it's a three or four but that would have been commented on because those are extremely rare 
Interesting. Is there anything, I guess, again, another question and, and Alicia may not want to know the answer to this as well, or maybe, maybe you do as far as working with safety or employers, as far as like what they can do to prevent. I mean, it sounds like most of these, especially two through four are just going to be your random, you know, traumatic. Right. Slip on ice, fall. Um, you can't really do anything. Like I mean, I, I treated, no, no, I did an IME on an executive who was at Mitchell was getting his car in the uncovered parking. It was icy. It was the winter. He slipped. He had a briefcase. He didn't fall. But in order to catch himself and regain his balance, he torqued his arm around. Um, and he it wasn't a slap tear because he was older. He tore his rotator cuff. And so I think these are just, if for lack of a better term, one-offs. You know, yeah. they're, they're trauma and they're truly trauma. Slip and fall, grab a handrail, fall on my outstretched arm, um, dislocate my shoulder. Uh, my arm gets caught in machinery and there's traction applied. Uh, I, I think it's going to be pretty clear in retrospect, just like a traumatic rotator cuff, an individual who either dislocates or falls and seeks medical attention quickly because they can't raise their arm. They went from a normal shoulder they can't, they literally have no attachment to the humerus, so they can't raise their arm because three of the four rotator cuff tear tendons have avulsed off the bone. So, uh, yeah, I don't know that there's any role for, uh, you know, unless, unless the working environment is such that they're not wearing shoes that are with appropriate grip or the surface isn't, so there's a lot of slip oh, and sure. falls or something, but Just prevent slip and falls. But yeah. even for the, um, type one degenerative, you know, do you, I guess, in your opinion, what type of work environment would even cause that? I mean, it sounds like it has to be pretty heavy work. It's not going to be your oh, typical yeah, labor. Right. Uh, well, I think it's uh, right. It's heavy. So for the type one or even the type two from repetitive activity that's right. seen in the athletes, right, it would be uh, a lot of heavy repetitive arm away from your body type, uh, usually uh, shoulder level or above, similar, I guess, to what a rotator cuff, a, a repetitive um, degenerative rotator cuff tear results from. So maybe using the right body mechanics, you know, working with safety yeah. and the employer to make sure people aren't, you know, reaching. And, you and know, that the weight levels body. are appropriate. It's a two person lift. Yeah. So similar to, so nothing outside of what you would do to prevent rotator cuff tears or really any shoulder injuries or, as far or, of a degenerative or a occupational standpoint, repetitive. No, I, I can't really suggest okay. any uh, across the board uh, dramatic changes to the work environment to prevent this injury. So we did get another question. Um, somebody wrote in, have you ever seen a slap tear from a car accident? <laughs> Um, actually I've reviewed a number of cases with that allegation and again, they're muddled because there's the MRIs done without contrast. Nobody can actually remember what they were doing at the time of the, some can, you know, were you holding the steering wheel? I think it's possible in a deceleration injury. If you're holding the steering wheel, that's that, that axial load injury. Um, and I think the MRI would have to show, you know, a type two through four, and it would have to be done in a reasonable time frame. But I think it's possible, yes. Interesting. Me personally, I can't remember if I've seen a slap tear from an auto accident, but I have reviewed cases with that allegation. Alicia, are you seeing, do you see a lot of slap tears in, in your line of work? Um, and, you know, do you work with them kind of on the, on the conservative treatment level? Um, we see a lot of shoulder pathology okay. regardless. Um, and it's a huge mix. It's more rotator cuff. Um, but I think to Dr. Somerville's point he made earlier, you know, generally it's that the employee was working and they developed pain. 
Um, sometimes there is a discrete discernible injury, like I was lifting X and I felt pain, um, or I was lifting and then I developed pain later that night or the next day. Um, so that's typically what what I'm seeing in the in the initial phases. And then of course we do um, obtain imaging um, and then get them to the appropriate specialist if need be. Um, but typically we're seeing just a full range of shoulder complaints and nothing specific to slap, but more rotator cuff. I, so when I make this comment, I don't want to be unfair to claimants, but we often ask them, what do you do in your spare time when you're not at work? Right, right. Yeah, sit As around. Yeah, yeah, they may, may, my point is they may not be very active. So mm -hmm. if you have underlying pathology, the only time it may manifest itself is when you're at work doing some something heavy. Right. Um, you, whereas it may have or could have manifested itself at home, you know, right. if you were building a deck or remodeling your home or whatever. Um, so there's a strong, obviously, association between the pathology and the onset mm -hmm. when indeed there may be no biologic or medical association between the two. Mm -hmm. That's a good point to make because I think that is one of the hardest things when I deal with pro se applicants, so applicants who aren't represented and they're, you know, they get the report from our doctor mm -hmm. saying it's not, and they're like, but I was at work when this started, they, they can't understand the whole manifestation um, option. And they feel like if they're at work, when it happened, it has to be work related. Be from work. It looks right. like we have another question. If you've had a slap tear surgery for type two, are you more prone for re-injury? That's a good question. Um, that is a good question. And I don't know the statistics on that, but I would say once you return to baseline and it's healed without other pathology, your risk for re-tear without another injury is back to zero or baseline. And is that for all types, not just type two? Or with three or four? So three or four, you're altering the anatomy. So you're okay. removing tissue. So those individuals may have you know ppd issues but also uh they have many of them do fine but they have altered anatomy so you're removing some of the labrum so they they may have a higher incidence of recurrence uh, for a three or four what about if you have someone who has a diseased shoulder already with degeneration and then they have a traumatic type two through four tear what about for them is there a risk higher for re-injury if they have a like a degenerative, like a type one, and um, if they're you don't address the, that, yeah, I don't know. No, I do know what I'm saying is, <laughs> I don't think so. No, okay. because um, again, you're if we're if we're saying that a type one is non-surgical and just wear and tear. And then you treat and restore the ana the normal anatomy of the tear that was pathologic. You would not have treated the type one, and in many of those, they're incidental and asymptomatic anyway. So I don't there's, I don't see any relationship between the two in terms of recurrence. Well, I think we're coming up on our time. It doesn't look like we have any other questions. I guess from a work comp perspective, I think there's been some great takeaways as far as what we should be looking for um, in potential slap tear diagnosis and especially when it's going on to have surgery as far as potentially questioning the claim and, and getting an IME to review it, especially the diagnostics if there isn't an MR um, arthrogram or if it's a non-contrast non MRI. So thank you, Dr. Somerville, for you. shouldering the burden of this mm -hmm. topic. Yes, thank you, thank Alicia. You. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. On behalf of Crawford Evaluation Group. And REM Occupational Health and Wellness, thank you for joining us today.